Well, you've done it again, my friends. You have stumbled upon the latest installment in Rob and Steve's traditional knives anthology. And this one comes with great fanfare. Hmm, recognize that box? The time honored logo. Case double X. WR Case and Sons Cutlery Company. Let's see what we got inside here. Hmm. Hmm. Lockback Whitler. 154 CM. Among other things on the label. Can't wait to see what's in here. Stick with me, guys. Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 28 December 2014 and yeah, pretty special knife in this box. This is property of Steve from How About the Truth. Thank you Steve for your continued support with inventory and research. <clears throat> Let's take a look inside the box, shall we? That 154CM on the label should give us a clue, shouldn't it? See, we've got a suede pouch. Hmm. Very classy presentation for a case knife, wouldn't you say? Let's see what's inside. We've got a knife wrapped up in customary case tissue paper. <clears throat> Case product inform product quality information literature credit for the literature terminology to Bob from Nice Town. Okay, let's see what's inside the tissue paper. Hmm. <clears throat> Not your grandpa's case knife, boys and girls. Looky there. Hmm. Some of you may recognize the detail work on this knife. This one is part of a family of knives <clears throat> of high-end collaborations between knife designer Tony Bowes and WR Case and Sons Cutlery Company. This particular one the Case Bose Locking Warncliffe Whittler. And while we're looking upon it, <clears throat> let's uh, go over Steve's research, shall we? I'll just read it to you as usual. New for 2014, we have the Warncliffe version of this knife that was first made a few years ago with a clip point main. We've already discussed in a previous video about the fact that the true Split back whittlers are the most difficult patterns to produce. Okay, I lied. <laughs> this Case Bose collaboration that is a near carbon copy of the genuine article made by Tony Bose, his son Reese, and another master artisan known as Ken Erickson <clears throat> take the split back design to a whole new level of challenges. It is believed that the great Tony Bose was the first custom knife designer to step up to the plate and shock the cutlery world with this elaborate pattern. Very few custom knife makers have ever attempted this design since. I'm not exactly sure of the year Tony first made this knife, 
but we do know that he has personally mentored the folks at WR Case on how to pull off this feat. Not only that, but Tony has licensed this design and many others that were first made by him some years before <clears throat> to be the flagship patterns that represent the very best knives Case has to offer. Let's pause to take a closer look at the knife. So there's the Warney Main. There is the uh, recurved pen blade. I'm not sure if the recurve is on purpose or not. And here's the small clip. Folks, knife, uh, nice as this knife is, make no mistake, it is not nearly as nice as the genuine article. The genuine article would be a full custom Tony Bowes lockback whittler. <clears throat> Allow me to point out the three gripes I have with this knife, and then we can move on to the features that make this a rather remarkable piece. The knife retails for $489 in the jig bone covers you see here. But most dealers offer it at $450, while a few are offering this knife for just under $400. A really good deal. As much as I love the color and jigging of the handles, also called antique bone, Case did a rather poor job of sizing the covers to the liners. The handles fit nicely uh, to the bottom side of the knife, which would be here. Perfectly flush, but rather poorly along the top edge, particularly on the rear cover. We'll look at that here. Can you see how proud the liner is to the cover? Uh, it's pretty doggone horrendous. <clears throat> Note the ledge or lip that is exposed uh, on the liner along the blade well. Next, they were rather inconsistent with the swedges of the main blade. Rob can point this out, and yes, I will. <clears throat> Let's look at it from the top. In fact, <laughs> it's not just the swedges. Let's kind of look. So the first step in the spine of the blade will be the plunge grind. The second step, the beginning of the swedge on either side. Okay, And I think it's pretty obvious how horribly asymmetrical things are. Uh, the plunge grind starts much closer to the pivot and is much deeper on the right side as you're looking at it than the left. And <laughs> interestingly enough, the swedge on the left side is deeper into the plunge than it is on the right side. The whole run of swedge on the right side of the blade is then much shallower than it is on the left. You'd expect if they were going to be off, they'd be off the other way to give you clearance above the nail neck. But this swedge, much broader than, the, than this one. <clears throat> and the left side swedge continues all the way to the tip, whereas on the right side, it stops a good eighth of an inch before the tip. Um, guys, <clears throat> that's horrible. <laughs> it's just horrible. And while we're at it, note how the plunge grind extends well past the sharpening notch. Got a big heel of material and a resulting recurve in this Warney blade. A Warney should never have a recurve at the base. <clears throat> the, the grind's essentially um, <laughs> They're horrible on this knife. And this was the second one Steve bought, by the way. This better than the first. Um, okay, so there are, these are two gripes, and they're rather unacceptable on a $450 knife, Steve says. My final gripe is the placement of the nail neck on the secondary clip blade. 
Although the little clip blade isn't a nail breaker, it's still a little harsh on the thumbnail. See how it's so far back? Almost, you know, the, the nail nick almost runs into the plunge grind. It would have been more customary for them to center it in the clip blade. Let's see how that would look. You know, there's plenty of blades sticking up for that nail nick to be centered out here somewhere. Just kind of odd. It gives you no leverage. And I think that's what Steve's talking about. While we're on the subject, those plunge grind to sharpening notch issues and asymmetrical grinds are, whoops, sorry about that guys. They're present on all the blades. And let's look at the pen. There again. Uh, I expect this and I'm dissatisfied with it when I see it on a $120 queen knife. Um, that's why I don't buy too many $120 queen knives. Uh, I'd be pretty smoked if I paid $450 for this one. <clears throat> just saying now let's get to what makes the knife great yeah let's do that for starters the knife is built like a tank and you're not a kidding uh, look at the width of the lock bar <laughs> guys that thing's almost a quarter inch wide and look at the look at the width of the blade tang uh, it locks up like a bank vault no play side to side or up and down drops free when you release the lock bar to about half of its travel, which is just perfect. It won't run into your finger. Um, just sort of drops there to perpendicular and stays, lets you flip the knife over and close it. It's great. And the construction is super strong, <clears throat> but it doesn't weigh much. You would think a knife with that kind of a lock bar and that thick of a blade tang would weigh a lot. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like much more in hand than the 77 Washington Jack or the 78 American Jack from GEC. And let's look at the liner thickness too, Steve wants to point out. Uh, comparatively to other traditionals, those liners are doggone near twice as thick as we're used to seeing. <clears throat> also, according to Case, this entire knife is made from 154 CM steel, not just the blades. <clears throat> Even the shield is 154 cm so liners bolsters all the blades all the locking hardware and the back springs and the shield all made from 154 cm i think however the rivets are nickel silver however <clears throat> case did a phenomenal job of fit and finish on the chassis uh, i will agree with that they just missed on the bone covers and the swedges of the main blade, along with the grinds, the main blade grinds, I would add. Note the milled liners that create a relief area for all three blade tangs. Let's see if we can see in here. You see the rivet, and then if you come toward the camera from that rivet, you'll see a milled line. So forward of that milled line is recessed. but it blends by the time it gets to the outside so you don't see the relief as you look down at the liners. Just very nicely done. In turn, that same milling process, Steve says, is in effect. Uh, it produces four integral bushings or spacers for the blades. These can be easily seen with all the blades open and inspecting the inside of the liners. Let's do that. Open up the whole well for you guys. See those milled areas? So what that does, leaving just sort of an integral washer for the blade to pivot on, it clears relief for it. So it only rubs where it needs to rub, where we want it to rub. And you're not going to see that blade, blade tang get all scratched up as we use the knife because of the relief that's cut. I hope that's making sense. <clears throat> One of my favorite things about this knife, Steve says, is the fact that the bolsters are soldered to the liners, making them integral as well. And dig those compound radius bolsters. 
they start almost flat at the bone covers but the machining begins to in increase as it moves toward each bolster tip so they become more rounded I think you can see that the way the lights hitting it a few minor flaws can be detected on the two large bolsters heck they even radiused the shield <clears throat> I will show you these flaws you can see that the thickness at the corner sort of of the bolster is different from left to right this near bolster is thinner here thicker here the far bolster is thinner here and thicker here and that same process or that same characteristic is re repeated at the back side of the knife thin thick <laughs> thick thin <clears throat> everything on this knife is just a little out of whack for $450 <clears throat> The pen blade, let's find the pen blade. Well, let's do good Whittler protocol. Open the main blade first. So the pen blade is a Tony Bowes design with his name stamped on the tank. <clears throat> Steve says, note that gritty feeling dur during a portion of the main blade's travel. Let's see if I can feel that. right here. I'm confident that will disappear as the knife breaks in because it was a bit worse at first. You can tell that it's coming from the outer circumference of the cam and not from the sides of the tang or the spacers. So let's see if we can identify what might be causing that. I think you can see this guys this blade tang this radius isn't sort of polished in this area just before the tooth would drop into the notch whoops there's just a small run of almost no cleanup then that will probably burnish and polish out as time goes by <clears throat> you can also see that in the bottom of the blade tang. You can almost see the pits from the heat treat scale and it's the same on that radius. I think that's causing that gritty feeling that you guys can't see or feel or hear but I can. <clears throat> so what a chunk of steel Steve says they started out with to make that main blade. Yeah it's thick. It feels fantastic in the forward saber grip. Uh, yes, it does. Because this tang is radius and so broad, your index finger just feels super secure there. And then if you plant your thumb on it for that sort of draw cut grip, again, super secure. So let's discuss the guts of this knife as Rob shows you guys with all the blades open. Hint, hint. What makes this baby tick? <clears throat> For starters, note how both back springs terminate in the shape of two quote-unquote snake fangs directly above and forward of the lock bar tab. Right in there, see them? Running along the liners on either side are the back springs for the two secondary blades, and they terminate by radiusing down in the shape of a snake fang and rest on the lock bar for the main blade. <clears throat> that lock bar and tab is called the tumbler. The tumbler is attached to the knife only by one rocker pin near the large bolsters, right here. Not only does the tumbler have an obvious interface to, the, to lock the blade, but note the large hump from inside the knife that would be forward of the snake fangs. Of course, that rocker pin passes through that area of the tumbler, but it has been carefully engineered and fabricated to act like a second cam that works with the cam of the bottom of the blade tang. The tension from the fangs <clears throat> causes the two cans to interact and thrust the blade closed. Let's 
kind of show you that. As I said, it drops free to there, and then, and it's, boy, that, for a, a knife that has pretty light spring tension, as far as releasing the lock, those cams really create a lot of acceleration. I mean, it snaps closed with authority, snaps open with authority. The subtle changes in the shapes of both these surfaces do indeed create the cam effect. When the blade is in a half-stop position, there's no tension. None. See, it's totally free. <clears throat> but at near open, and especially at the 45 degree angle of closing, you can feel the blade literally, literally being pulled shut. But not like a conventional backspring. Uh, and I would say he's right. That It is so linear. There's good tension even when the knife is fully closed. <clears throat> uh, interesting. Note, there is no rocker pin at the center of the knife handle, but instead we see two pins side by side that cancel each other out as being a pivot. Rather, they work off each other to make a sturdy stationary piece. So that means these two pins go through both back springs. So about here and about here. And you can see that sort of raised portion in those two back springs. So you've got this section from this pin to this pin that's completely restrained and the springs only only move from here to here and from here to about here. <clears throat> I find it incredible, Steve says, that those two back springs only have about three quarters of an inch of, of length to flex without breaking. Now that we've inspected this system before anyone assumes that it's not really that complicated, quote unquote, I ask you to hear the words of Ken Erickson. Ken used to be a highly respected gunsmith and the transition over to custom traditional folders was befitting of a guy who is so passionate about perfection. Ken is now one of the very best of the best along with Mr. Bowes. <clears throat> when Ken first attempted this very pattern, he gave Tony a call, as he often did, to borrow the actual pattern. Another friend of Ken was kind enough to loan him one of Tony's actual knives like this to get a hands-on feel for how the knife should function. Now armed with the actual original pattern from Tony and one of his knives to refer to, Ken was ready to begin. The following are direct quotes from Ken from a thread he started on the Blade Forum's website. Quote, I went through three different sets of backspring pairs before I finally got them to work properly, and it was only then that I realized what Tony meant when right before we hung up the phone he said, Have fun with this one, buddy. Ha <laughs> ha! Think about that. The man literally fabricated, heat treated, and tempered three sets of springs only to go to waste. Ken is a devout Christian and lives a good life. Bear this in mind as he continues, quote, one evening when I walked up to the house from my shop to have dinner with my wife, she said, I heard some really loud and salty language coming from back there earlier. <laughs> this knife was really getting to old Ken. Uh -huh. But he succeeded with flying colors eventually. <clears throat> I encourage everyone to research Ken's work, as well as Tony's and his son, Reese Bowes, to see the finest custom traditionals ever made. All three men have won many awards. The waiting list for a custom-made knife from any of them is measured in years, not months, and costs thousands, not hundreds. Case did okay with this pattern, but missed on some things. Buyer, beware, and I would second that. Just like other production knives, they let some real duds leave the factory. I had to return my first one, says Steve, <clears throat> politely, if you're in the market, demand a pre-inspection from any seller. Case made 300 in this antique bone, 300 more in chestnut, 200 each of ebony and stag, and only 100 in genuine abalone. Prices go up according to the choice of handle material, and many of them have the hit-and-miss swedges like mine. 
Some have much nicer swedges. Now, is the knife worth the price? Well, they sell slow, so you have plenty of time. Weigh your own reasons and shop carefully. Three exclamation points, Steve says. For those of you who may have assumed that this complex design surfaced much later in cutlery history, I gotta hand it to you. You are absolutely 100% wrong. <laughs> Believe it or not, several but not many companies were making this design well back into the mid-1800s. Even Queen made one. I don't know if Case ever did. <clears throat> Between 1880 and 1920, the New York Knife Company made this exact pattern, but with 1095 carbon steel and brass liners. Impressive. Well, that concludes Steve's research for this knife. Um... My impressions of it, I guess, really mirror what Steve said. Um, it is a super cool knife in so many ways. The mechanics of it are like nothing else. And, the, and mechanically, the knife is so well executed. I mean, it just handles like a dream, built like a tank. Super functional blade set, warning main. clip secondary and a pen secondary um, <clears throat> you can't beat that for a Whittler my problem just lies in the details um, guys there's there's no way on God's green earth I'm ever gonna spend 400 bucks for this knife um, you know like I said mechanically some of the fit and finish really good other parts of it you know I'd be disappointed if I, if I saw blade grinds like this in a $50 case, much less a $400 case bows. I mean, even the, the inconsistent radiusing on the bolsters, it's just, uh, I don't see it. Don't see it, guys. Maybe that's why they sell slow. Don't know. Kind of a bummer. I was really excited to that Steve had bought this knife because I really wanted to have it in front of the camera. Uh, I, I watched a lot of uh, the Case Bows Lanny's Clip knives be bought and sold and reviewed over the last year and really kind of had one on my radar screen. I love the fluted bolsters on that knife. And I know Steve's more of a Whittler guy, so this is the Case Bows that really sort of tripped his trigger. And I was Really looking forward to getting it, just to see how this collaboration was working. And guys, frankly, it's not going well. Um, perhaps there's a collectability factor here. But it's a very disappointing knife. Hmm. Does the tone of this video sound a lot like the first Buck Loxa video I did? <laughs> kind of feels that way to me. But it's a pretty significant knife, flawed as it may be. So that's that. Episode 12 of the Traditional Knives Anthology is in the can. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word is sharp.